I'm Lonnie McGee and I'm in the statistical science department. Um, I started spec screening last semester. Um, there's a graduate course that's our first year methods course in statistics and also an undergraduate course that's a senior level course. Um, and, and I did it again this semester. So um, I know there's a million ways to do it. And good, bad. Like, and I think it's been good. The students responded really well. The one thing I think that I know one way you can do it is when you do specifications grading, you can actually give them a second chance or however many chances you want to get the specifications correct. And they loved that, especially because we did a lot of coding and a lot of you know uh, things where things could go wrong. And as long as they turned it in, you know, and I was able, you know, I was able to. Um, you know, correct them and say, you really need to look at this piece. And then they could be, then they would know to correct it. And I think that was better for them than just right, wrong. You got to be right, you know, so. Cool. Okay. We're glad to have someone else in the experience. Here. <laughs> um, I'm Caitlin Demery, the inaugural department chair for the graduate overall studies and dispute resolution programs. I'm Simmons, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I come from an administrator's background um, in industry. And so I've only been teaching for a couple of years adjunct. So it's it's very eclectic <laughs> CV that got me to this point. So anything I can do to sponge and think about relatable um, to what you share to our particular area of humanities to social science coursework. I just want to learn and so can apply. All right, great. Well, and you you may not have some of the bad habits we do in, as ingrained, so maybe that's a positive mm -hmm. sign. Yeah. Derek Conker, I'm uh, Mark's long, 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 long time colleague and film and media artist and the chair of film and media artist. I got yeah. the boss right now, so thanks for coming. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I, I'm categorized as specs curious, I suppose, because uh, I haven't used specs grading. I've heard uh, a lot about it here and there. Uh, I've been frustrated with my own grading systems and um, motivations that students have in, in my work um, in media studies. And so I'm looking to change it up and see what, uh, what specs grade can maybe do to, to make that more interesting experience for, uh, for the students, uh, at least. So. Cool. Hi, I'm Christy Apt. I'm an assistant professor in um, applied physiology and sport management. And I'm pointing because my building's right over there. <laughs> uh, well, A, I just, I love CTE. I love what you guys offer. Um, so when I got the email of the offerings, I was reading through it, and this this session sounded really interesting. Um, I'll be completely honest. I know nothing. I've never heard of spec grading. Um, but I, I share your thoughts as well, because I feel like education has changed so much, and I feel behind. So I'm not convinced my grading policy or even exams is the best way to assess whether my students are getting anything out of the coursework. And I have kids and the way that my kids are graded in middle school is totally different than what I ever experienced and what I'm even offering. So I think there's an opportunity to change that I think is going to be more reflective of how education is actually running right now. So I'm here to learn. Cool. <laughs> also specs curious. I'm just going to steal that one. <laughs> I'm here. So Paige Weir, um, I also am from the Simmons School right now. I'm serving as your associate provost for faculty success. Um, Thank you. And, and, and I'm a big fan of Mark. And so I'm here to support him. And also just, I love learning new approaches. And especially when those approaches come out of other disciplines. Like, I just love that this is film and media studies talking about spec grading. That's mm -hmm. so cool to me. Like, that just, it's so purposeful and thoughtful. And um, I'm particularly interested in how new way to think about grading intersects with like generative AI and the concerns right now around chat GPT because it seems like we're going to have to be more innovative in how we approach grading and what counts as de demonstration of learning. So I'm I'm not just specs curious, I'm like very experienced yeah, about right. like how do other people approach grading in higher ed? Um how that life it is. Let's hear it, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I know we have some people online as well, and I'm just going to say, I'm going to try to keep an eye on both, but I'm going to be bad at that. So Abby's watching that is going to let me know that there's things going on in the chat. Um, so it sounds like we have a pretty wide spectrum from knowing nothing about this to already using it in classes. 
Um, so um, I guess what makes sense to me, but to make sure this is useful for everybody, is I have some stuff prepared that I kind of prepared for like, let's assume you know nothing and then we'll see what we could dish out. I'm gonna do that, but try to go through it pretty quickly and get everyone on the same page of what this is. And I'd like to get, it sounds like maybe more of the discussions on, hey there. Um, <laughs> I'm not really, I would actually have to do this and do it. So I'll do like kind of quick overview of the process and talk about some of the why we would do it. And then I'll wait for people get coffee and pictures. Mm -hmm. While you're waiting, I put comics up that have to do with grading, but all of these also will relate to specs grading in one way or another. Um, so this one is about everything being true or false, right or wrong, no in between, uh, which goes along with the concept in specs grading that everything is pass or fail and there's no partial credits or anything. Um, this one is going to tie to an example I have. The first time I did specs grading really screwed something up which was uh, leaving too many loopholes and not being clear about the one's specifications. Um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then this one, I think, just gets to the sort of overall vagueness sometimes of how it seems grading is done. And if you <laughs> got like a 40% or a 70% on something, what does that mean in terms of how much you know about the class? Is that good? Is it bad? Were you successful at picking up the material or whatever? Um, so I just wanted to put that up while people are coming in. Um, but let's get to it. So this is the topic which we already talked about. Um, and thanks to CT for uh, sponsoring it and to Aaron and Addie for making this happen and Addie for helping on all the making this work. Um, so uh, so here's, here's kind of an overview. Like I said, I'll do a quick, what is spec screen? Just kind of like lay that out so we have the groundwork um, and the core concepts of it. And then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, I think well, it sounds like a question several people have, like, why might you do this? What are kind of the advantages of this relative to more traditional grading scheme? What are some of the challenges of it? And things where it can be problematic or tough. Um, and in some way, I feel like that's intellectually a little bit backwards because I'm kind of like, here's the thing before explaining like why you might want to do this thing. Um, but I think in terms of some of the examples and stuff, it'll make more sense that way. So that's for the first part, just kind of like, Bear with it and like understand what the thing is, and then that will when we kind of get into why that might be useful, hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, and then, like I said, I'd like to have some time to talk about options and do a little exercise trying to think about how you might adapt this for one of your own classes. So that's kind of my game plan. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, I should point out uh, if you're really interested in this, this is like the definitive book on it um, and really goes in depth. It's a pretty interesting read if you're interested teaching, research, and spec training and stuff. Um, and what this is really good at that I'm going to skip over a lot of is the kind of more uh, research-based justification for it, like what's going on in higher ed and, you know, what are challenges that we're facing and how can, what does the research show about this style of grading and how that approach you into that? That's great. It's all in here. Um, I'm going to focus more on like the big picture, sort of like conceptually, why might we want to do this? Um, also, I think a couple of the arguments they make in there are ridiculous and don't make any sense, but there's also some, a lot of it is really good, and then there's a few things that are just bizarre. Um, the other one, this is actually what first got me started. Somebody had sent me this um, article, which is great. It's a math professor talking about how he'd use specs grading, um, and it is a very specific example to his context, but I think hopefully gives a lot of similar types of information that you might get here. Um, and uh, I assume we can send this out to participants so you can have these links and stuff if you didn't get it here. The library has that book if you want it, by the way. Put um, that into the chat for those of people. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so for this presentation, I'm drawing on some from both of those. I want to make sure to get done credit. Also, some other stuff I've read online um, and also my own experiences. I've used this in a couple different classes over a few different semesters. And I will share with you some of the things that went well and some of the complete mistakes I made so that you can learn from my mistakes and not make those same ones. Um, so uh, let's start out for those who are kind of not novices to this, what is spec screening? And I'm going to say, even if you read the book, there's a gajillion different ways you can do this. There, this is not a methodology. You have to do A, B, C, and D, adopt every single part of this exactly as is, and this is it. I would think of this more as like a framework or a different way to think about grading and course design. Um, and then you can do all sorts of nuances and examples. And I'll say even in uh, Linda Nelson's book, which is called Specifications Grading, she has tons of examples. She has syllabi from people and stuff. It's great. 
I don't know that there's a single example in there that is actually true pure specifications grading. Everyone puts their own sort of spin or nuance to it. So I think that's important is like, don't feel like it's something you have to go all in on, do everything this way. It's something like find what parts of this framework are useful for you. Um, that's a, it is kind of hard to define because there's all this stuff going on. Um, I boiled it down to what I think are sort of the three key aspects of at least thinking about this framework. Um, other people may disagree, but they're not the ones giving the presentation. So you're going to hear what I say, and we can help with your own list later. Um, so this is, for purposes of this talk, what I would say is like the core of how I understand specifications grading and the way to think about it. So item number one, um, you have some core assignments. It may be everything in sort of a pure specs grading model. It would, it may not be. But you have some core assignments that are graded as either they're satisfactory or they're not. Pass, fail, there's no partial credit, nothing in between. Um, and the term specification grading comes from, you actually lay out very clearly specifications for this assignment. This is what you have to do to get credit for this assignment. And if they did it, they get credit. If they don't, they don't. Um, so that's kind of the core of it where the name comes from. Um, part two, uh, which Bonnie mentioned a little bit, is um, students have the opportunity to redo stuff. So even though everything is pass fail, it's not like if you do an assignment wrong, you're screwed, there's a zero, you failed the class. Um, this is, I think, one of the most challenging things to figure out the details of how to execute, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the kind of core idea is you do something that doesn't meet the specifications, the teacher tells you that, you get some feedback on why it doesn't, and that feedback may vary. Um, if someone really just like completely dropped the ball, they were supposed to write a thousand word essay and they turned in 50 words, you say like, this is supposed to be a thousand words, you don't need to give any more feedback. It might be more detailed, and I'll show some examples of things like that. But you're letting them know, here's where you, this did not live up to this bar I've set, and then they have a chance to redo. And then um, the third thing, which uh, I think is kind of the most interesting in sort of the overall core framework, is that students have autonomy in what they do. So there is some degree of you choose what assignments you want to do based on what grade you want to get. So you come in at the start of semester and say, I'm really, this class is really important to me and I need good grades, I, I got to get an A on this. Like, okay, here's what you have to do to do that. Um, so I might say like, hey, I'm second semester senior, I already have a job lined up, I just need to pass this class, I'm doing it for fun, I'm perfectly fine with a C. Great, here's the requirements for a C. And that sounds pretty straightforward, but it's actually pretty different than most of what we do. Most of our classes are built around the assumption everyone's going to do all the assignments and some will score better on them and some will score worse. And somehow that adds up in the end to some sort of final grade. Um, and so this is a really big difference. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I would generally think about it as there's kind of two categories of approach. And this one is they do more assignments. So very simple example, you might say this is a class where we do 10 problem sets or something. And if you want an A, you need to do all 10 of them. If you want a B, you do eight of them. If you want a C, you do six of them or something like that. They could also be more difficult assignments, and I'll show you some examples of that. So it might be like, okay, everyone needs to do this assignment. If you're going for an A, you need to do it at this level. If you're going for a B, you do it at this level. And by level, I don't mean how good it is. Think about the specification. So again, to use a really crass example that I don't use in my classes, but just a simple essay, you might say, okay, this is, needs to be a 2,000 word essay if you're going for an A. It needs to be 1,500 words if you're going for a B. So the specifications are actually different. Um, so that's the sort of core principles as I would think about it. Um, and again, people may disagree, but it's my class for today. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, real quick, here's a, a simple example of this. And this text I realized is a little bit small. This is from a VFX class I teach. Um, and class was organized into modules, so different visual effects techniques people were trying to learn. Um, each of the modules had some sort of exercise to demonstrate doing that. So, for example, there was a section we did on removing stuff from shots. So, you know, if you accidentally left a camera case in the shot and you have to go in and take it out in visual effects. Um, and they would do that and turn it in like, okay, you demonstrated this correctly. Um, all of the modules had what I call a basic level exercise. Most of them also had a more difficult version of it. Um, and so that's the kind of exercise based version of this. We go back in. Up here, here's item, item number one, is there's these different exercises, and they're all satisfactory, unsatisfactory, no partial credit, you did the exercise right, or you didn't. Here's part three, the sort of base grade thing, um, and as you can see, 
if they were going for a higher grade, they had to do more of those modules and or they had to do more of them at the challenge level. Um, and you can see there's a little bit of differentiation here. In this particular class, this was the big one, is if they wanted a higher grade, they had to do more of these more difficult assignments that took more time, more work. And most of the time were, if we put these into, uh, I'm, oh man, maybe all my names wrong, but one of those educational hierarchies, um, a lot of taxonomy, thank you, Oops, taxonomy. A lot of the basic ones were mostly things that, okay, here's a lesson, and then I want you to go kind of replicate doing that same thing. And then the challenge level ones were usually like, okay, take that thing we did, and you're going to have to figure out how to do some other parts and take some other pieces from other things we've learned and put it all together into a bigger thing. So it was not just more work involved, but conceptually more difficult. Um, so that's part three, that they kind of choose what grade they want. And they know this at the beginning of the semester and can kind of plan around how many of these assignments I'm going to do and how am I going to build up my schedule. And then lastly, uh, everything from marketing complete or com complete, and uh, they could get resubmitted if they did something that did not meet the specs. And you can call this pass-fail or complete, incomplete, or satisfactory and unsatisfactory. I use this just because I'm Canvas. That's the default marking is choose complete, incomplete, so it matches up with that. Okay, so that's a sort of simple example. I actually had some other modifiers to this class, and we'll get into like more detailed versions of this, but that's the core idea. Um, so for those who haven't had experience with it before, that sort of core concept makes sense of like what this is and how you would build a grading scheme this way. Yeah. Hey. So I'm curious about the incomplete being resubmitted. Um, and I anticipate that you were, you're saying that you give different levels of feedback based on different things, right? Mm -hmm. So at teaching writing a lot, I, mm -hmm. I find that I do pre-visions instead of revisions because I want the student's best work coming in before I basically give them a ton of feedback. And I worry for myself that I'll get a dashed off submission just so they can say it's done. And then I do the heavy lifting of giving the feedback mm -hmm. and then I have to grade it twice. So I, I hope that as you go through, you can point out ways in which you have mitigated against carrying the burden of doing the performance for the student by allowing resubmission. So that I found in my own work, sometimes I feel like I'm carrying the burden of doing the assignment for them. You're already much smarter than me because that was a huge mistake I made the first time. Yes, we could talk about some strategies around that. Um, I, really, I haven't fixed it, so I want to hear your strategies. I don't know if it's a problem, but it's still a problem for me, so I can't wait to get to that part of your talk. You know, Paige, one experience I had as a doctoral student that I've carried into my teaching is um, in the EDD program, they, some courses would build in like steps towards the big project, mm -hmm. like the research design project. And so you would be getting feedback towards that final, say, chapter three, and then Part of your grade as you went forward was taking the instructor's feedback as you worked towards. So there was a way to get closer to that, you know, cumulative effect without the instructor having to regrade like the abstract proposal. You know what I mean? And that was a, a nice way to um, encourage people to learn from the feedback. You know, I'll say that's actually how, even aside from specs rate, that's how a lot of our film production classes are set up where they're like, turning in a script and we'll get feedback on that. And then they're turning in a treatment for how they're gonna shoot it. And, then, and they're getting feedback along the way before they have the final film. But then also there's a separate grade component of how did you process the feedback and use that? So furnish that. I don't I don't wanna make you like wait for something. I'm fine with just like discussions we have. So um, you, hit, you hit on one of the big challenges of this when I have a slide of challenges, it'll show up there somewhere later in the presentation. Um, is figuring out a, a reasonable and fair way to do this, to give them that chance that like if somebody put in the effort and got something wrong or they didn't quite get this concept yet, that they can you know get it up to that next level. Um, at the same time, you don't wanna be taking on all the burden. I'll say one of the mistakes I made the first time I did this VFX class, um, I hadn't thought enough about that and basically said like, you know, turn in resubmissions and I'll do them. And I had one student in particular who, as with most of our syllabi, it's like always the outlier student who does the crazy thing that you're like, okay, I got to figure out, like, close that loophole. Um, who, like, would turn something in and I'd be like, okay, this doesn't meet what I'm looking for in these ways. Would, like, spend five minutes, make some quick fix, turn it back in, in the hopes that now it somehow magically worked. And I'd... Are we there yet? Right, right. 
Uh, <laughs> these kind of things, it still doesn't beat any of those 10. Or, and, and like, I would get like 15 submissions in two days of the same project, not even substantively changed. So like, I need to find a way to deal with this. Um, <laughs> the way I have dealt with this is um, in more successful iterations is um, putting a limit on either the total number of submissions for a given exercise or in the class I'm doing right now, I just do it on the total. Like you can submit one thing per week. Um, and that's a class where uh, in terms of this exercise thing, there's a total of up to six they could be doing. So they actually have time over the semester. They could submit each one, get feedback, fix it, and turn it in again and still make it through the semester. But they can't like, they can only turn in one thing per week. That could be a new exercise or that could be a resubmission of one. So it puts some stakes to it. Like, sure, if you want to dash off a draft and it's crappy, I'll still do my work and put in the feedback because you just used up one of your chances and now your next one better be good because you're going to start getting behind and not being able to do the other ones. That's a brilliant solution. Thank you. Um, and also, it, like, one thing that you can do is put in the specifications that you need to have a reasonable attempt to meet, attempt to meet these specifications mm -hmm. of the assignment. So it's not the half ass yeah. or my French submission just for feedback, but you show that you had a reasonable attempt to complete within the specifications of the assignment. And that's a pretty common specification to put in. It's like, let's make a reasonable attempt. It's like recursive somehow, but like at the bottom of the list, must make a reasonable attempt to meet all these above things. Um, I actually don't mind if someone does a half assed attempt if you have a limited number because it's like, okay, all right, like I'm not doing any more work than I would if you had made a better attempt. You're making it harder on yourself because even if you take this feedback I'm giving, you had so far to go, you may not get there on your first try and you kind of used up your attempt. Um, another, another thing that I haven't done, but uh, Nelson's book talks about and I've read other people who use um, with some success is like some sort of, I basically want to say a currency system. Often it's called a token system where, you know, at the start of the semester, everybody gets five tokens and there's various things you could use them for. Um, and so one could be, you need to use one every time you're doing a resubmission. And so you don't necessarily have enough to resubmit everything. So you think about it. Some people would use them for like, if they have an attendance policy. Okay, this will, if you use one that excuses an absence um, or all, you know, there's different ways to do some sort of system like that. But it's one of the big things you have to think about because you definitely find yourself in a grading hole as i will say the first attempt at this the students ended up liking it it was very disastrous for me it was way more work than normal grading because i set up my class there so. well i will say one more thing when i when i would do you can revise for a grade i would have to grade everything twice as soon as I set up, send in a pre-vision a week ahead of time, and I'll give you feedback within 24 hours. If it's already an A, I'll tell you that, and you're done. As soon as I did that, instead of revise and put the onus on the students to have to turn it in early, I would get maybe 5% of students taking up on it. It was really interesting just by moving the deadline. So I, I like some of these ways of putting the ownership of back on them rather than the last minute kind of. Well, and actually what you're describing is a little bit like it's like a partial version of the specs yeah. grading. So like you turn this one, it met, I'm setting the bar here for A, it met that bar, you don't have to do anything else, it's done. Anyone who didn't meet that bar, you're like, you need to resubmit and yeah. try to do better. The difference then being you were grading those and they might get different levels of grade, but it, it, it's adapting a component of that, yeah. Good job. Yeah, please bring up questions and discussion points as we go. Um, I guess one question I have, I mean, yeah. how big are your classes? Small. Now, this would be hard if you're teaching introductory statistics and you have 90 students. So um, there are some, I, I agree. <laughs> um, first off, there's some example in Nilsa's book with people of classes of different sizes. And I think one of the- um, It's an organic chemistry. One, right? one of the, right. Yeah, one of the strategies is you have to think about what your exercises are differently. So for, for instance, um, I don't teach our screenwriting classes, but we have one class where students write a feature-length screenplay. You, if you had 80 students writing a feature-length script and you're going to like read it, just reading it once and like grading it is a huge part of already. Like if you're supposed to read those and give feedback and let people, like that wouldn't work. You'd have to think of a different way to do that. Or, you know, I would uh, argue that if you have an 80 person feature screenwriting class, there's a problem in the structure of your curriculum. But, <laughs> but you, you would find different. 
excuse me, you find some different exercises and different ways to approach it. I'm going to try to find it. Um, I participate in occasion on in a future trends forum. And there's an MIT guy that's a big believer on cumulative grading. And he talked to our group and he, and so I'll find the book in a minute. But his whole point, he teaches biology mm -hmm. for pre-meds, that kind of thing. And his whole philosophy is all about cumulative grading and making sure that people master the foundations before they move on. And he is teaching this larger classes. So it's like, if you if you continue on with a 70%, you're on a really shaky footing and this is our next doctor, you know, that kind of a thing. I'll find it and I'll share it with you in a minute. I mean, my classes are small because I'm talking about upper division courses and graduate courses, but trying to transfer this down to, you know, if you want the whole department to be doing this, then how do you manage that? Yeah, well, and, and something I, I would say, I'll have, I'll have a slide up here later. Uh, I, I'm sort of an evangelist for this, and then I think it's a, I think it's a really productive way to think about teaching and course design. I haven't converted all my classes because, um, because part of it is figuring out like what, given the context of the type of material you're doing and the scope of the class and the number of students, there's things where it's more or less easily easily accessible. I started with the VFX class because, like, of all the classes I teach, it was like. The easiest one that like is inherently broken up into little bite-sized pieces that don't relate a ton to each other, right? If you can build a 3D model of something that has very little to do with whether or not you can remove a case from an image, it's completely different techniques and stuff. So that was kind of why I started with that. And then I've been slowly phasing it into other classes. There's actually a class I'd like to do it in that I didn't because our curriculum is changing and this is the last semester I'm teaching. I'm like, it's not worth overhauling the whole course this semester. You're like, I'll wait till the new version comes in and maybe kind of launch it that way. Um, but yeah, uh, one other thing when you're saying about the foundations, um, another thing that I actually did in the VFX class and, and shows up in some other examples as well is these don't have to all, it doesn't have to be entirely flexible. It's like in the VFX class, the first two exercises, everybody had to do. And you couldn't do any of the later ones till you moved on, till you successfully completed those, because those were kind of the foundational ones. Like, here's the core of what we're doing. If you don't get this, you're not going to be able to effectively do the other things. And I think in a lot of science classes, that's a good model to adapt, having some of the foundational stuff that everyone is required to do. And then there's more variety on the higher end. Um, the flip side of that, I will say that it, I think is uh, does require a little bit of a change in mindset, is I think we... I'll, I'll say me, I don't want to put projection onto anyone else. Um, I sort of think everything in the class is important, right? I wouldn't be teaching this, wouldn't have it in the class, it's not important. And you kind of have to get over that a little bit and say like, okay, what, is it, what does it really mean to get a D in this class? Someone is passing, but like the bare minimum, what do I consider that? And you can't just say, no, everyone needs to have mastered all the concepts and done them all, because if that was really the truth, everyone would get an A or an F, like either you did or you didn't. And if we're going to have a grading scheme where you have letter grades, which for better or worse, you kind of do, um, you do need to start thinking about like, okay, here's all the course objectives I'd like people to get, and I'd like them to get at this level. I think at an A, they should get all those at that level. What does a B mean? Maybe they get, they accomplish seven of the objectives, but not the eighth one. Or maybe they accomplished all of them, but at a lower level, and like they understand the material, but can't apply it, or whatever it would be. Um, and so this is one of the things where I think it's actually really productive. It makes us think in a way that we, again, I won't say we, that I generally don't when I'm doing a standard grading class. I'm like, here's all the stuff we're going to do. Everyone's going to get through and I'll sort of gauge how well they did. It makes you think about what does it mean? What am I saying if I give someone an A or B in terms of tying this back to what I want them to get out of the class and what they've shown they can do? Um, and I think this might lead into this slide. Let's see. Um, Okay, uh, this is one I like is that they have to kind of successfully, they have to pass something, meet these specifications, and it's not putting all this weight on a particular test or like they crammed the night before, got this done. It's they showed they could do this at some point. If they tried it the first time and couldn't, you tell them where they went wrong, they get a chance to redo it again. And the idea is when they've successfully removed the camera case from the shot, I can say, yes, this student knows how to remove a camera case from a shot, and I can kind of check off they've done that objective. Um, there are ways in terms of comprehensive um, approaches. The um, math professor article that I, I posted the link to earlier 
Um, he talked about starting to do this after a couple of semesters because he was worried people like were whatever they did the exercise at the beginning of the semester, they erase that from the memory to make room for new stuff and get to the end and, and win. So he created a sort of final exam that was basically like redo a couple of the exercises you did and show me you still mastered that material. So there are ways to kind of deal with that. Um, this I think is a really interesting one. Uh, Nilsson talk, talks about um, that I thought was a really smart way of thinking about this is it allows you to set a bar for things and that bar can be pretty high. So instead of saying like, you did this project, it was okay, you got to see, um, or you did, you know, you did this, it was mostly right, I'll give you some partial credit, fine, you can set a bar for, I want you to do this at this level, and if you don't, you're not going to get credit, and if you set that bar way too high that no one can reach, then you're going to have a problem, um, but it gives students something clear to shoot for, and it kind of tells them, this is not acceptable, if you turn in something less than this, no, you're not getting credit, you got to redo it, because we want to get to this level, this is what we're shooting for. Um, and I like that it makes the bar very clear and it something she talks about in the book that I think there's some truth to is this idea that when students know they're going to get partial credit or going to get graded by something like yeah if I did it I did something and did it decently I'll get some credit and that'll be enough to kind of keep my grade afloat um, and this again if they're shooting for a C or D they might not be doing all the same assignments they might not be doing the harder level ones. you're saying like no if you're going to get a C it's not just sort of half-ass everything it's like do these things, but you need to do them to this level so that I feel comfortable that you are at a C level on this. Um, lower stakes for each assignment. Students, I found, really appreciate this, like knowing they do something, and if it didn't go right, they can turn it back in. You're not putting all this weight on a big project or your midterm or final, and on most of the things, they're going to have a chance to correct honest, I don't want to say honest mistakes, but like something where they didn't quite get something right, needed some feedback or needed some additional instruction or to review something when they get it. Um, somebody mentioned it, I think, Paige. Um, putting the responsibility back on the students. Um, and I really like this. Something I was surprised by, I think SME students generally are very grade conscious. I was worried that I would do this and everyone would be like, well, I got to go for the A. And they don't. Like, they're actually pretty conscious about this. And like, man, I have a busy semester. I'm taking 20 hours. If I know I can do this and maybe not putting quite as much work and get a B, I'm fine with a B in this class. Um, in fact, I think in the classrooms I've done, a B is kind of the most common thing they go for. And then you'll have the ones who shoot for an A. And I've had a couple who like go for a C or D because they're like, I literally need three credits and I'm out of here. Great. Um, but I, I like that it, it, it makes them think about it and do it consciously instead of just doing everything at some level and kind of crossing their fingers. Hopefully I'm doing the right amount of work to end up here. Um, allow some schedule flexibility. This is good and bad. I'll talk about it with challenges. But um, in the editing class I'm teaching right now, where they have, like I said, a maximum of six exercises they can do, um, we talk about this at the beginning of the semester, like, hey, if you know you're going to have a busy, what semester are we? April. <laughs> um, and you want to, like, front load and do a bunch of exercises at the beginning and kind of free up your April when you're not going to have to do, do assignments for this class, great. Or if you're really busy at the start of the semester and you know you're going to have more time later, you can do that. Now, students are not always great at managing their time, which turns out to be one of the challenges with this, but um, the students like that it gives them some flexibility and kind of like, not just how much time to devote to the class, but when to devote that time within the semester and kind of shuffle things around. Um, this gets at what, um, one of the things I think, I think Paige was talking about with the previs and like the providing the feedback. I hate figuring out partial credit. I feel like it's, I honestly hate grading. I feel like, you know, they say professional football players, they're like, they pay me to practice. I play for free on Sunday because I'm going to play the game. I feel like they pay me to grade because I would go in and talk to students for free, but oh my God, sitting there grading stuff, I hate it. Um, you still got to do grading, unfortunately. Yeah. But what I like is that I found I'm spending much less time thinking about grades, thinking about scores, and really just responding to, here's what you did and where it needs to improve, or this was great, it's done. Um, I don't know that my grading time, well, the first semester, it went way up because I screwed up. Um, once I did, started doing it better, I don't know that my grading time actually went down. I think it probably stayed about the same total, but I felt like I was doing more of the type of grading I like to do, which is providing feedback and not just providing feedback. And they, you know, we've all had the thing where they like flip through the feedback and get, what was the grade? Okay, that's all I care about. I'm giving them feedback when they're going to have to use it because they need to revise the project. Um, so you know they're using the feedback in some sort of productive way. Okay, that all sounds great, right? Maybe not. We'll see. Um, the, but these are, these are, I think, the sort of 
again, Nelson's book gets way more into detailed stuff on it. For me, these are kind of the aims of this and why I like this model. Um, so here's some of the challenges with it. Some we already talked about. Um, these first two, though, I think I've underestimated the first time is we're not used to it. And so it does require you to really rethink things. It's not just changing your grading scheme. You kind of got to reshape how your whole course is set up in terms of what the assignments are, you know, what assignments am I saying everybody needs to do? What assignments am I saying, hey, only the students going for an A need to do this assignment, which in some ways means I'm saying this is less important. And that takes some rethinking. The students are also not used to this. If we hit some point where a lot of people across campus were doing this, we would get over that hurdle. Right now, I have to spend some time the first day. I assume you've had the same experience, like explain to the students, okay, this is not going to be the same way most of your courses have been graded. Here's the grading scheme. Here's the choices you're going to have to make. Let's talk about it and get questions. And they've been receptive to it. Um, and I think find it interesting to the degree anyone finds grading interesting. I do. Um, <laughs> But it, you know, it's one of those things you have to make a conscious effort to. You can't just like put this up on the syllabus and assume the students know what's going on. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, I don't do contract grading, which you should use in um, one of your syllabi, which we talk about. But I, I do um, the first week have an assignment that's based on Canvas that's like basically sign this thing saying, I read through the grading scheme. I understand it. If I had questions, I talked to the instructor and figured them out. Um, basically just making them again take some ownership that like hey i know this is weird if you don't understand something like don't sign this let me know write me an email tell me what doesn't make sense um but you do have to explain it to them and it's a bit of a learning curve and they're not used to having this kind of autonomy in what the actual assignments are they do for their classes and so that takes some getting used to for them um puts a burden on the students to manage their schedule as i mentioned um something i've done that seems helpful um, although I have not done a controlled study on it, is recommendations. So for instance, here's a Canvas page from my editing class. Uh, this is when we were supposed to meet last week, which this didn't actually happen, but we were home for ice. But anyway, um, here's what we're doing in class. Here's their homework. And then for their exercises, I have for each day, like, hey, if you're going for an A, here's what you should be doing that week. Um, and some of these are, you know, take a couple weeks. So it's like, start working on this project, continue working on this project. Other ones are like, this is one you should be able to knock out in a week, do this exercise. Um, and I tell them like, this is, I'm not holding you to this schedule. This is not required. If you're not going for an A, you don't need to do all of these, but giving them, a lot of them seem to appreciate having some sort of guideline and like, they're not up in the air to figure it out. And if they want to just go through and do everything the week gets assigned, they'll get through the semester and complete all the things they need to. So I would recommend doing some version of that if you're giving them that schedule autonomy because they're not great at managing it. Um, VFX class, again, first time I did it, very much did not think of this ahead of time. Also did not have the policy about how many things they could submit in a week. And I think the last two weeks of the semester, maybe half the class was doing like two thirds of their exercise and just like frantically trying to get stuff done and send it, which as you can imagine, the work quality wasn't great when they were doing that, um, but uh, something that helps. Okay, my biggest mistake first time I did this, uh, you need to have very specific guidelines. It's specification grading. You have to be super clear about your specifications um, to let them know this is what the bar is and to let you know. Let me show you an example of how I screwed this up. Um, so from that first class, here is one of their exercise assignments. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a video of what they're what you're doing. But they're basically, it was basically an exercise in working with 3D objects in space. Um, and here's where I put the requirements. Replicate the designated segment. I showed them the segment. Then a little bit about how they had to turn it in and stuff. This is not detailed enough. And I'll show you how this becomes a problem. Can you let us read that for a second? This is like foreign language. Sorry, you can kind of ignore all of this. I'll show you what the assignment is. The requirements is sort of the key part. And you can actually skip all the details of that. So basically my requirement was, I'm showing you something, replicate that. Okay, so um, that's showing up right. Okay, so this is what they were trying to replicate. Um, this is like from the beginning of the Marvel movies. You've probably seen this. And so it's this 3D text thing, and the camera's kind of like pulling back and things are moving. Um, and then we got this little studio thing kind of coming out like that, blah, blah, blah. Um, I will tell you, not relevant to specs rating, they did not have to replicate the. Oh my gosh, where's my mouse? It's all over the place. 
they did not have to replicate like the videos playing on those, which it turns out is like 17 orders of magnitude more difficult to <laughs> happen. You have to build the letters in a completely different way and stuff. Anyway, okay. So uh, here, I'm just gonna X out this so I can see what I'm doing on my screen. Okay, so that's what they're trying to do. And I gave them a tutorial. There was uh, some videos online they could watch. And this is kind of like the demo that came out of that. Like this is what reasonably they could be doing. Okay. So here's a couple examples of things I got submitted, and you'll see where I screwed up. So here is one. Okay. And I would, I would look at that and say, well, you left out this whole studios part. Your movements were super jerky. The video is just like kind of playing behind this whole thing instead of being contained by it. I didn't specify it. Like, does this replicate the designated sequence. They could certainly make an argument that it did. Um, and that's on me for not specifying it right. Um, here's, no, here's another one, different problems. Um, again, we've got a little bit of uh, jerky movement. Um, you know, if you notice what they're doing with the studios or that they have that part in, but they just sort of squashed it and then it's like stretching itself out. Also, it's moving like completely independently of the other stuff, like you're not all <laughs> saying me. Also, they didn't line up their letters here, right? Um, is this a reasonable attempt at that? Absolutely. This was not like a half-assed, like they just did a quick thing, but the question is, does that satisfy the requirement or not? And again, this is my fault for not putting the specs right. You have to be super clear about what you're going for. What I like about this is it makes you think, okay, what, what is really the purpose of this exercise, right? What things do I care if they did right or wrong? So in the case of this, something that I did actually mark this wrong and told them I didn't need to do and they fixed it. Um, the fact that this was all moving totally separately, the whole point for me of this exercise was working with stuff in 3D space and moving stuff around correctly. And the fact that these things were all moving separately when they were supposed to move together. It tells me you're not doing it right. But again, the student can make a legitimate argument that this replicates that reasonably well. You can tell what they were going for. You can tell what it's supposed to be. So um, learn from my mistakes, clear specifications. Here's an example from uh, my class this semester where I actually like did this much better. <laughs> so th this you can or cannot read through just like description of what the assignment is, but here's the thing I now put for each of these things. Here's what to get this mark complete, here's what you have to do. And some of it refers back to here, some of it is um, more specific to things, but these are the things I'm looking for. And you kind of think of it like a rubric, all the different things you'd look at, but everything in the rubric is graded pass or fail. And if you get a fail on any of them, you fail the assignment. Um, and one thing I want to point out with this, because I, I have talked with people who have a kind of misconception about this. This doesn't mean there's nothing subjective about this. So this is for an editing class. Here's one of the assignments, one of the requirements. The edit has to highlight the Slicky and Charlie dynamic and make it clear that their relationship is driving the story. That's a subjective judgment call, right? I'm not looking like, did you check this box? I'm watching it and saying, do I feel like your edit, edit highlighted that relationship? That's totally fine. You can have subjectivity in, in here. You can have things that require your judgment, but you're being clear about what the judgment is. So not just writing, it has to be a good edit. And that's up to my judgment of whether it's good or not. I'm telling you, here's for this assignment, what I want you to do and what that means for me. It also means you don't have to grade everything in every assignment. So for this particular assignment, like if their audio is terrible, I don't care. I said, that's not a focus of this assignment for me. And it's not something that I'm putting in those specifications. I'm not worried about their color grading. If they haven't put in titles or whatever, none of that is on here, so it doesn't matter. It makes you focus what is really important to me. If I was redoing that Marvel assignment, I did redo it at some point. Um, you know, I put in things specific to the 3D generation and the moving things around in 3D because that's what was important to me um, for that particular exercise. Make sense? So again, learn from my mistakes, be better. <laughs> um, need to keep up with the grading if you're gonna allow people to resubmit stuff. You can't like get their assignment, hold on to it for six weeks and then turn it back like, yeah, I need you to redo this thing that you did six weeks ago. Um, I found a good strategy that worked for me with these shorter exercises, and again, in smaller classes, is uh, I would sort of designate a period each week that's like blocked off in my schedule, like grade any exercises that came in and turn it back in. And then the students know like, okay, if I turn stuff in, 
I'm going to get feedback at this time and can move on to the next thing. Um, I think most of us are pretty good at this, but it does require having a handle on the whole semester at the start. You have to know how many assignments are there going to be, which ones are going to be required or not. Um, I found I really need to kind of build out all the assignments ahead of time as opposed to what I wish I was better at, but often during the semester, I'm like, yeah, I know there's going to be this assignment and I'll make sure I have the details on it ready by the time they're getting to it. You really kind of need to build things out all ahead of time um, because it's tough to change things mid-course. I suddenly say, actually, we're only doing 10 exercises instead of 11. How does that change the whole grading scheme and stuff? Again, first time I did this, I actually did have to change mid-semester because I had over, uh, over imagined, it's not quite the right word, overestimated what the students could reasonably do. But I had to sit down with the class talking like, hey, I think you guys are behind on this, not because of you, but because I was over ambitious in what we could do. Here's how I want to change the assignments. Here's how I want to change the grading scheme. Is everyone okay with this? And it's a lot more complicated than like, if you have 10% of your grade is quizzes and you don't do one quiz, then the other quizzes are worse slightly. That's a lot easier. Um, have to have a plan for grading resubmissions. We talked about this. Uh, Canvas sucks for this. Um, <laughs> There are, if you go online, you can find people who have built all sorts of jerry-rigged work workarounds that kind of half make it work for this. But basically, I just tell the students, like, go on Canvas to see if things were complete or incomplete. In terms of actually figuring out your grade, ignore anything it tells you, because there's not a good way in the current structure to do that. Um, you can, I will say you can build an Excel spreadsheet that does this very nicely. It takes some work. Um, I'm kind of a Excel nerd, so I like doing it, but I have, you know, I have a thing like at the end of the semester, it just says like, okay, they completed this many assignments, this many were challenge level, and actually just tells them here's what their grade was, so I don't figure anything out. It's doable, but Canvas does not like it. And um, last thing here, I think this is easier to use for some types of class and content than others. So we talked about in terms of class size, that makes a difference. I don't think there's a type of content that you just couldn't use. Um, I know, uh, a misconception that you see online is people think this only works in sort of STEM classes where you have traditional problem sets and stuff. I'm using it in film production classes. I'm finding it works really well for me, um, but it's a more natural adaptation for some things than others. So kind of thinking about what you're doing and how it might fit with that. Okay, um, so <laughs> those who haven't, haven't done it, let me uh, sort of, low on time here, let me real quick kind of talk through the process and I would encourage you kind of as we're doing this maybe think about in the context of a class you do how you might do this. Um, so just like any course think of the course objective you want to learn um, and then this is the part like I said is kind of hard is figuring out how do those correspond to grading things and you can't just say everybody has to master everything because that would be lovely I would love to have a class where everyone just always gets A's all the time because they did master everything <laughs> It's not realistic and it doesn't really, the specs creating idea is that you're giving students options to kind of shoot for different levels. So you have to figure out what those are, what things are important for everybody to get, what are things that maybe demonstrate higher levels of mastery and would be higher grade. Um, then you come up with assignments that relate to these specific objectives. So again, had I been more thoughtful about this the first time, that Marvel logo thing, which I thought was a cool assignment and students had fun doing it, like, what did I really want to get out of this? Because some of them focused on very different things than I wanted them to because I didn't write the specs right. <laughs> the person spent a ton of time, like, making this great, like, metal texture of the letters that, like, reflected light in all these interesting ways, except that it wasn't in 3D, which was, like, the whole point of the assignment to me. Um, so figuring out, okay, for this objective I wanted to get, here's an assignment that's going to do that, show that at a particular level. Translate these into your base grade setup. Um, then consider modifications. And this is kind of the last uh, info I want to get into is um, a little bit about those. One more page, page here, quick. We talked about all these couple of things that are satisfactory. Think about what loopholes students are going to find because they will. Um, and remember, you don't have to judge everything on every assignment. So for this assignment, this is what I care about. If it's a coding thing, I care about if the program does this, I don't care if you made a good user interface for it or whatever the thing may be. Um, and then clearly spell out those criteria both for the individual assignments and for the grading scheme. Again, they're not used to this on the grading scheme. You need to over explain it and make sure it's crystal clear to them. I actually listed out in my syllabus in a couple of different ways. So one is like, 
okay, in terms of the exercises, here's what you have to do for this. In terms of this other thing, here's what you have to do for this. And there's a separate thing that says, if you're going for an A, do this. If you're going for a B, do this. Um, and really try to give them all the information clearly. And if there's policies, for instance, on resubmission so that you're not stuck in that hole, um, all that other sort of stuff. Um, and then, like I said, last thing was some other options or ways to think about this. We talked about a little bit of token system. Uh, this seems fairly common. I have not tried it. I have nothing against it. I just don't really want to manage dealing with tokens and have kind of needed it with design classes. Um, this is a big question people seem to run into, like, is there an advantage to students saving their tokens? Do they get some kind of reward for not having to do resubmissions or something? Um, some classes have talked about where they have ways for students to kind of get more tokens. If you do a really good job on this assignment, or do this mastery level thing, you get an extra token that you can use later in the class or whatever. Um, bundles, this is slightly different than what I talked about earlier. So I've mostly worked in sort of exercise-based things where you kind of choose, like, I'm going to do this many versus this many versus this many. Um, a lot of people use bundling systems. So if you're going for an A, do this block of work. If you're going for a B, do this block of work. So you're giving them autonomy in what grade they're choosing to go for, but not so much autonomy in the specific assignments and stuff they're choosing to do. Most of the time, those build. So like the B block is everything we did for a C plus something else. Um, and that is something you want to be careful with is think about what if someone's going for a B and doesn't quite achieve this thing, did they then do enough for a C or have you built your system in a way that if they didn't achieve the B, they failed the class because the bundles are so different. Um, so you do need to watch out for those kind of problems. Um, and a term check, we talked about, talked about this, like some way of making sure they still retain some of what they've done. Um, and then modify it outside the specs. This is, I'll be honest, where you can get things really complex and creative depending on how much work you want to put into it, um, but allows for a lot of variation in how you do this. And I'll show an example of that. Um, contract grading, um, whoops, um, something I mentioned, uh, Mania done in her class, and that's similar to this, but you can talk about how you do, do it in your class, but basically it's instead of like the student kind of is going for stuff and getting things done as they go through, they're basically writing a contract with you at the beginning of the semester, like I am shooting for A, B, I am going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G to achieve that um, and kind of lays that out. And you're basically saying, if you accomplish these, then you will get that grade. Um, so it's a sort of more formalized version and makes them take that responsibility at the start for here's what I'm gonna do. Um, you would have to figure out your policies for what if halfway through the semester they decide, I'm not going to make this, I need to go for a lower grade, or actually I'm doing really well, I want to go for the higher grade. How do you adjust that? Okay, um, here's uh, from the current editing class I'm doing. I'm going to blow through some of the details on this, but I just wanted to point out ways that you can modify this beyond the specs grading base. Um, so I have exercises similar to the VFX class. There's also two projects everybody does. These are graded by percentage with a rubric, as we call it, gotten used to grading. There's also two exams uh, that are designed to be easy and let them get high scores. And one of them, they get multiple chances to do it, but there are still exams. Um, there's also some things they just have to turn in. These are generally works in progress. So like turn in a rough cut on this day and just show you've done some work on the project. Um, and then I have this last category of responsibility, which is attendance, participation, critiques of classmate work, and all this other stuff. So those are all the things that they're doing. The way this then goes into the grading is where you can get really complicated um, if you would like to confuse your students, which apparently is what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> this is really small, but base, base grade stuff. So there's still a sort of exercise base overall. For an A, they have to do all the turn-in assignments are done in these respects. For a B or C, they can miss some of those, so they didn't have a rough cut ready on this date or whatever. And then on the two main projects, they have to, for an A, get at least an 80% on both of them. So I'm still incorporating some traditional percentage rubric ratings on this, but instead of weighing that with everything else and factoring it in, like, okay, that project was 15% of your grade, and let's weigh that in, just like kind of a spec version of that. Here's a spec. You have to hit 80% on this rubric um, if you want an A in the class. And I like the ones for the D, basically. The bottom thing is you have to turn something in for both projects. One of them could be terrible. You have to at least turn something in. Um, da, 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 whoops. 
Okay, and then here's how then here's how the exams and the responsibility fit in because this is how I get my pluses and minuses. So if you do really well on the exams, it can raise your base grade a bit. If you did all the stuff for a base grade of B, but you got 85% or higher on the exams, you would end up at a D plus. Um, same thing for the responsibility, except here the base is that you're supposed to do everything. If you do less than everything, then it starts lowering your grade. Um, so that would be not attending classes or bad participation, stuff like that. Um, I'm not suggesting this is a particularly good version of this. This is something if you start looking at examples, you'll see people have all different sorts of modifiers. My point just being, you don't have to think about this. It's just, I come up with this base grading scheme and that's it. And there's no other way to incorporate other things in. In particular, like attendance and participation is something a lot of people seem to use some sort of secondary thing grafted onto a specs grading base for. So, and I can send this to anybody who wants to read this in more detail. Um, that's the actual presentation part. I'll put this up to, to remember we have upcoming workshops. Fault this day. Uh, I apologize, I'm bad at doing PowerPoint. There is a don't make crappy PowerPoints <laughs> semester that I will be going to. So if you come to my workshop in April, I will hopefully have a lovely PowerPoint next month. So uh, anything people want to know? We kind of ran out of time. Sorry, I talked a lot. Other things we want to talk about, ask questions about, I'm happy to hang out and do so. I think one of the things that I really liked about this is that A for effort really means A for effort in this in this game. Because they do, I mean, in, in the way I structured my class, it looks like in the way you structured yours, there's a lot of effort going into making an A. Yeah. And I think that that's rewarding to the students. And I think it can be a good thing, too, because it, I, I really believe, and I think the students get this, that in this sort of system, anyone can get any grade. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, well, I came in and I'm just not inherently good at this. I'm not going to be able to get it. Like, hey, here's what you have to do for an A. If you're not inherently good at this, maybe it takes you some more revisions to get stuff, but you can get there. Um, and so I think it makes things feel more accessible. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, the person who's just like naturally good at something doesn't automatically get an A. They still have to put in that effort. Um, so I agree. Yeah. 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 Yeah.